The Constitution of Burkina Faso clearly states that men and women are equal. The government has ratified international agreements and treaties related to gender issues, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination. Thus, the national gender policy was established in 2009. Although Burkina Faso has ratified the main international and regional women's right protection instruments, their provision remain widely violated in law and in practice. There have been campaigns particularly concerned by uh, the continued violation of women's rights in Burkina Faso with persistent discriminatory legislation, uh, violence against women, harmful traditional practices, including early and forced marriage and female genital mutilation, unequal access to property and obstacles to access uh, and access to justice. Well, joining me live from uh, Dar es Salaam um, is um, Lillian Mabula. She is a real estate agent and she's also a women's rights activist. And from Dakar, Senegal, is Burkina Faso's Valerie Traore. She's a rights advocate and she's the founder and executive director of NEIL. Thank you very much, ladies, for joining us. Thank you for having, you for having us, Marianne. Oh, I'm going to start with you, Valerie, because I just gave statistics for, about Burkina Faso, but it sounded like statistics coming from any African, any other African country. So we, see, we have similar issues. Um, let's start by talking about the general issues that women face uh, in Burkina Faso and why this can be a problem for them to rise up to the challenge of even vying for political positions. Absolutely. One, well, thank you for having me. And, and you're right in saying that those issues are the same across the continent, right? When you look at the statistics of Burkina, they're quite harrowing, and especially from a country where we've had a president, and today is a, is a public holiday in Burkina Faso, um, even though I'm in Senegal and it's not here, but we had a president who coined the phrase, there is no revolution without women's empowerment, and that was Thomas Sankara, and we still abide by that today. What is true is that you have a, a plethora of women's organizations, women's groups that have been fighting, and have reached quite a large set of wins across the country when you look at the significant reduction in FGM, some of the things you mentioned, the uh, outlaw of that, the outlaw of uh, forced and, and um, youth marriage. So that has been true. However, in most of our societies, the laws tend to be far ahead of the social norms that follow them. So you also continue to have certain gatekeepers within the society that keep reminding people of this is where a woman's role should be. In your conversation earlier, be it in media, be it in science, in all of these sectors, there are cultural norms and culture um, and social norms that keep women from thinking this is where I will go because if you aspire to those, you're automatically categorized in a certain uh, societal um, ideal. And that really keeps young girls from seeing themselves in certain roles and from seeing themselves able to do that. And that is today, I think, the biggest challenge uh, because it is a battle. It is a battle for power. Is it, it is a battle for space. And unless we increase the number of women that are in political decision-making power, that are establishing policies, and that are making sure young girls keep on carrying together with them, it is going to be difficult to continually open these spaces for, for younger women and for people that are striving to be in all of these spaces that do determine our policies. Okay. Lillian, you are, you are, uh, yes. been, you've been working in Dar es Salaam, you've worked in Mbeya, you've worked with women and boys. Um, <laughs> what has been the greatest challenge that you have seen across board um, for women uh, who mm -hmm. seem to maybe be um, in either low income families or women who have been divorced or have been battered or abused? Um, the biggest challenge, especially for, for the women who have been divorced, is the stigma. Unfortunately, instead of society sticking with the side of the woman, she actually gets blamed for getting divorced. They say, they tell them, you know, marriage, it's all about understanding, giving each, uh, each other chances. So they even call her names, you know, just because she chose to actually walk out of that abusive marriage. So that is, is one problem. And unfortunately, there is not enough counseling for these women. They don't have open spaces where they can talk about the trauma and get healing. So unfortunately, most of them, they are still suffering from PTSD. 
Interesting. Um, let's talk about um, governments giving spaces to women in, in positions of authority. You and I were part of a program which uh, was called Women in Politics yeah. um, and Civil Society. How powerful is civil society in Tanzania and how um, has it been able to affect women to take up more responsibilities, be it at the local levels, to lead in their communities? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, now there is a lot of advocacy. Women are stepping up to the plate. I mean, just um, as of 2020, uh, women hold uh, approximately 40% of parliament seats. So from the grassroots level, women are stepping up more in Tanzania. And uh, I strongly believe part of the reason for that is because uh, we have actually had our very first female vice president when we went for the elections in, in 2015. So I think seeing a woman in that powerful position has really motivated other women to partake in, in politics and civil society. Okay. And, and quickly wrapping up, uh, because we're really, really out of time, Valerie, um, what do women in Burkina Faso look up to, look forward to in the future? This year's theme for the um, um, International Women's Day is choose to challenge. What should the women in Burkina Faso be choosing to challenge this time around? It's, it's really hard to say uh, what women look uh, in Burkina Faso look forward to. I think women, especially young girls, look forward to the same thing, to being able to make choices for themselves, to being able to have the opportunity that anybody, any boy, any other girl living anywhere in the world would have, to be able to live with dignity, to be able to have access to sanitation, and to be able to visualize herself growing up and not being afraid of all of the obstacles that she will see along the way. And those are things oftentimes that make people say, well, I won't dare because not only do I have to, as everybody on this uh, show has said today, fight twice as hard, be 15 times as good. But on top of that, even when I do that, the whole world still stands there and pushes me back. I think this is what every one of us as women, every one of our sisters, our younger ones or older ones are aspiring to is a world where just because we are women does not put 15 obstacles in front of ours. We will fight those 15, we will get beyond those 15, we will take over our, our rightful place, okay. but it just is so difficult that we hope that those barriers with time will be lesser. All right, ladies, thank you so much. This has been a really great conversation. Valerie Traore is uh, the um, founder and she's the CEO of um, Neil and of course uh, Lilian Mbula, uh, she's the executive director, I beg your pardon, of Neil. Uh, you can go find out what <laughs> Neil is online. Um, Lilian Mbula is a real estate um, executive and she is also a woman's right advocate, both of them. Um, Burkina Faso and Tanzania. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. So thank you, Marianne. All right, well, that's it on the show. It was a Women's Day special, and we had women from all parts of the world talking to us about women's rights and advocacies for women to be higher up in the echelon of things in society across the world. I am Mary Anacon. Thank you for being part of the conversation. Uh, you can watch a playback of this on our social media channels, on Facebook, and, of course, on our YouTube channel. Have a good evening.